You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 437. Film is a battleground. Sam Fuller. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Well, guys, today on the show, we have film producer Bradley Gallo. Now, Bradley has been a producer playing in the indie film game for a while. His 2019 film, Them That Follow, was an official selection in the Sundance Film Festival, as well as doing a few other little films like Mr. Wright starring Anna Kendrick and Sam Rockwell, The Call starring Halle Berry, and Careful What You Wish For starring Nick Jonas. His most recent film is Wild Mountain Theme with Emily Blunt, Christopher Walken, John Hamm, and Jamie Dornan. And he's also producing the upcoming film The Green Hornet and Cato for Universal Pictures. Now, Bradley and I sat down and just started talking real raw facts about the business, about what it really takes to produce a successful independent film that actually makes money in today's world. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Bradley Gallo. I'd like to welcome to the show Bradley Gallo, man. How you doing, Bradley? I'm doing great. Thanks for being on the show, my friend. How are you holding up in this weird and wacky world that we live in today? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I'm too busy thinking about all the development projects we have that I actually just sort of block it out. But I'm I'm sure that uh, everybody is suffering in their own right. And and uh, I totally understand. You know, it's tough. It's it, it is it is tough. Like I was saying earlier, the struggle is real uh, without question. And, uh, you know, I, you're either going to, you either chicken little or an ostrich. I think those are the two, you're either just like, I don't see anything. I'm just moving forward or, oh my God, the world's coming to an end. I tend to be more the world's coming to the end guy, but I, <laughs> I know people who are very ostrich. Like, you know what? I can't deal with that right now. I just got to focus on what I can control, which is a lot healthier, sir, than where, sure. I, where I live. <laughs> I'm trying to be positive. I have a similar mindset sometimes. <laughs> I always say prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And that's, and that's all you can do. Uh, Now, how did you get into the business? Oh, wow. I got into the business a long time. Well, first of all, if you look at my fifth grade yearbook, I wrote, I want to be a movie star. And I think a lot of people who are in this industry always wanted to start out by being an actor. Like that was kind of the thing you were in plays and all that stuff. 
it didn't come around to bite me as a bug until later around 17, 18, when I was trying to be a veterinarian. I thought I was going to go to college to be a veterinarian. I was at all the different vet, like tech, you know, I worked at every single veterinarian hospital in Long Island, New York, and picking up poo most of the time. But, uh, you know, I had an issue with putting animals to sleep. That was my big, like, yeah. I couldn't do it. But I was in love with these these veterinarian books that were written by James Herriot called uh, All Great and Small. And it was just like, it was stories. It was storytelling through animals. And for me, I realized at one point that it wasn't about the vet thing that I liked. It was the stories that I liked. And it came right back around to, I need to be in film and TV and I have to figure that out. And that became a very long journey. Um, starting in graduating college with a totally different degree and then becoming a production assistant on sets in New York, keeping the faith with, I don't know if you remember that, Edward Norton, Ben Stiller movie. Yeah. And, uh, An Autumn in New York, which was a Richard Gere movie. Yes. Back, with, the back with one owner writer. Production. Yeah, with one yes. writer. Yeah. Those were the production assistant jobs that I had when I first started. Um, so that's kind of the entry. And then I realized it was a 30 year old. I was 21 at the time. There was a 30 year old production assistant on that set. And I said, there is no way I'm going to be a production assistant at 30. That was what went into my mind. Oh, no. During, during the time of, you know, when, you know, Edward Burns would make his movies and go to Sundance and there was, you can make movies for like 30 grand, but you were like thinking it was just a weird time. It was very Sundance related in the nineties. Oh, yeah. So. I said, well, okay, like everybody else, I'm going to go write and direct and produce and star and raise the money. And of course, that's a lot harder than you think. So uh, I had a lot of energy then, a lot less now. Um, <laughs> and then I, I, I sort of accomplished that. I raised money from doctors and lawyers and, and, and family and all the stuff that you do then. Um, and I wrote a screenplay and I started the movie and I put it together Good and I, I, I actually shot it in a summer camp because I knew at that time summer camps were the thing. Like you made horror films at summer camps, right? So I knew you could make them for real less. I had a connection because I'd gone to a summer camp. I rented out the camp after the summer was over, $10,000 to feed the crew, house the crew and use all the locations. Sold. So, so I, I wrote a screenplay around it and, and, and that's literally how, uh, the first movie came to be. And then, of course, that went to festivals. There's no easy way of how you get there. It was also but, a different – it was also a different time. You're talking about – you were still in the 90s, right? Yeah, 90s and uh, 2000s, right yeah, on the early cusp there. Yeah, that's, and that was a whole other world. <laughs> totally other world. But you're asking how I started. Sure, sure, so that, sure, that's sure. That's kind sure. of it. And then, and then when September 11th hit, it was impossible to raise money for movies like 2008, like now. Um, th- this stuff always comes around. And so I, I pivoted to television at that time. Um, and reality TV was blowing up and I needed to pay rent. I had come out of my family home at that point. And, um, and so I worked in reality TV. I ended up on a reality TV show. Uh, and Which it was one? called America's Next Producer. <laughs> Next <laughs> one? Is it to- really? I, I never Next heard Producer. of this. I never heard yes, of this. Of course, because it lasted one season. It was on the TV Guide Network. So you're like, was there a TV Guide Network? There was. There was. Remember, they had the stream across the bottom. Yes. And was the, they actually made programming above the top. <laughs> so I was in one on that show. That's amazing. And I got into the top ten, and you know, I, I then had my breakdown because you know they don't they don't feed you. They don't you, you don't get to you have sure. no sleep. It's purposely set up for you to get into fights and all that stuff. So I did all that. And then um, – and coming out of there, I kind of was sort of fed up with my dreams of like I wanted to be in film and then there was reality TV. And, both. and I just said I want to do something a little bit better for the greater good. And I went back to school and I got my master's at Columbia um, in journalism, uh, which I did really well in the school and, and came out uh, with a CNN fellowship and started working for CNN. I was eventually rotated through the shows, ended up on Anderson Cooper's show for a bit. Um, and then journalism got to the way it is today, which is it went massively by, you know, polar, almost bipolar, um, where we're on one side of the argument, the other side of the argument. And I just, I, it wasn't, it wasn't speaking to me in the way I wanted it to speak to me. There's nothing wrong with journalism. It's just, it's changed. And it wasn't, uh, it was again, back to the stories. It was, it was less about the stories and more about the headlines. And I wanted to get deeper into stories. Um, so I, I moved, I, I made a couple of phone calls uh, I had some connections in L.A. and I t- totally moved way late into my 30s to L.A. Um, to start my career all over again from the bottom with somewhat of a background in media. Um, and then I was sort of a creative development exec and uh, in a company called Troika and then headed their production and development and started producing the films and sort of built my 
career there. We had a hit early, The Call with Halle Berry. Yeah. It was a very a hit movie very early. Um, and then, of course, I made subsequent movies. It Some worked, some didn't. And, uh, you know, the rest of the career is where we are right now, which we can talk about. No, which which I always find it fascinating because I've I've had so many people on the show and I've talked to so many filmmakers, uh, successful people in, in the in the industry that they go, yeah, I went to college and I got a degree in ballet, like something so <laughs> a degree nothing. in horticulture. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, but I, re- but I, what I really want to do is direct. You know. <laughs> And it's always it's always fascinating because I see people like like that all the time. Like I went to film school. Like I always knew I, I never wanted to be an actor, actor. Thank God. I always knew I wanted to be a director and a filmmaker. So I went to film school. So when I hear people like I went to a four year school and got a degree in something else, but then I'm like, yeah, but I really want to be a director. So I I I, I, be, I PA'd, and I've seen those thirty year old PAs. I saw forty year old PAs, okay. and it is terrifying. I got a, yeah. when I when I started paing when I was in I was paing in college, and then once I got out of college and, and got my first jobs, I started paing on the side, and I just said this sucks. I'm going to go into post because at least there's an air conditioned room in there. Sure. And I I learned post, and that's how I kind of went down my. You learn path. a lot. You learn oh. a lot in the post production. In fact, that's even better. I've learned a long time ago that I wasn't going to be the director, and I'll tell you why. I mean, I can direct a film. If you hire me to direct a film, I know exactly what you have to do to do it. Sure. But can I be good to the level of getting above the noise? Do I have the talent that's so creative that it's so like Universal is going to be calling a Netflix? Like that kind of talent. There are so many more talented people than me that that's not where I lie. I lie in the journeyman version. I can make do the movie with that script. But in terms of the, the the angles and the thinking and the way to be even more beyond, I didn't have that that level of uh, uh, talent, in my opinion. And so from a producing standpoint, what I like the most about it and why I got so into it was that I get to be a part of every single part of the process and have a little bit of an effect and then think of it from a big picture perspective. So I'm involved from the idea to the script to the prep to the production, to the post, to the distribution, to the collection, to the accounting, to the end. You know what I mean? And nobody is able to do that. Everybody comes in and out yeah. at some point. And, uh, and, and, and that is a good thing for me because I'm very good at sort of managing people to do, do their best as opposed to being my best isn't going to be as creative. Uh, if that makes sense. So no, that, that, that's that, kind of what I came to this. That takes a tremendous amount of self awareness, uh, to be able to, to be able to, to say, you know what? Sure. I, I can do this. And I, it's kind of like me, like I can, I, I lit my first feature, but I was like, can I light of, can I be a cinematographer for a feature? Yes. Am I going to do it like Deacons? No. I will no. never even get to the remote close. Like I wouldn't even be in his yeah. shadow anytime. So can I make something look decent on screen? Right. Yes. Sure. But I, I'm like, no, I'd rather hire somebody. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what it, that's how I ended up trying to fit because a lot of people always ask me like, how do you figure out which one you want to do? And it's like a lot of the directing thing is ego. Either you have it and you want it and you need it and it's mm-hmm. everything you've ever been, or you are just ego. And um, <laughs> I'm and sure you met those guys and too. That doesn't bode that doesn't bode well for an actual collaborative process. So uh, so frustratingly. Um, you know, I've, I've run into that. <laughs> so, so let me ask you, so let me ask you, because I made my, my, my last feature I wrote, I did, it was called on the corner of ego and desire, which is about filmmakers, uh, and their ridiculous egos and how we are delusional and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I, what do you do as a producer when, because the ego doesn't show up in the interview process. A lot of times the ego shows up. Oh, I, I, it absolutely shows up for me only because I'm so. In tune to it. Specifically in tune okay. to it. Now. Okay, good. But I know what you're saying. There are people who can be a certain way to get the job and then it starts to get really intense. I always look at the person in the interview and I go, "What? where's the level in the interview? And then I'm going to times that by five or six. <laughs> and then I can I work with that? Sure. If the level of the interview is at the 10, oh. you know you're done. You're done. No, it's you're done. Mess. So how do you deal? Uh, so how do you, as a producer, yeah. how do you deal with egocentric directors, actors, uh, co-producers, collaborators, like how, because you're, you're, you're Papa Bear. You're kind of right. like, oh, you're overlooking the whole thing. So everyone right. comes to you. When something goes That's wrong, the, the producer is like the most abused job on the set. Right. 
Yeah, well, the first thing that you do is you set the tone early and you have to have the relationship with the director. If you don't feel like you're having that relationship from the interview to the prep, then you got to get out. It just does it. You, you got to find a new director because it's a three year process, you know, in, in making a movie. And, and in the director, it's at least a year of that. So you are like 24 seven with that person. You have to, first of all, you have to enjoy that time. If you want to be with that person making that vision. And, and if you're not feeling that early on, even in, even in like early prep, it's over. You got to move on if you can't uh, sustain that. But let's say you get past that and then the ego is still going to be there. You need a healthy amount of ego because they, they have to drive decision making. They can't be like, I don't know what decision to make. What do you think? What do you think? What do you, they have to have a vision and a decision has to be made. But they have to have somebody in their ear sort of swaying in, in a direction that works for everybody. So sometimes I call myself the bridge between art and commerce. Right? You can't make a film without understanding that. Mm. So there are times when you have, to, you have to say to the director, look, you don't need this big concoction with the drone and the thing and the ba ba ba. We can shoot it like this, save a bunch of money, and then you get the scenes you wanted over here. Right. So there's a lot of that in indie filmmaking and that's about the comic. But then there's the other side. You know, we're going to need some extra money talking to the investor. Right? This idea that just came out of this is amazing and it's going to change the way the film is going to look. And so we need this extra money. And here's why. So I'm bridging that back and forth. But when the ego is flying in the middle of that, that's when you have to check the director. Why do you need this? What is your reasoning for acting this way? Tell me. I want to understand artistically how important that is or isn't for this vision. And when I get that, I'm either able to – I feel a very strong internal talent to say, you know what? You're right or you know what? You're wrong. And then I have the answer for why they're wrong and then they have to sit with that. And, and they start to respect you early. You have to set this tone early. <laughs> And when they start to respect you, either by your body of work or by what you're saying because you really understand your shit, then they're going to go in a way that starts to work for you, that the ego starts to work for you. If they don't respect you and or they are so stubborn in their ego, you're likely in trouble. And in that scenario, um, it's not going to work. And it's just, it's just not going to work. And I, and I just sort of set the tone early that, yes, I'm the boss – but you are the boss of the vision and I want to support that the whole way. But I will have to sway you depending on how far off you're going from the original vision that you pitched us in the beginning, from the original vision of the script and what the financiers and or studios are expecting. And that's my job. Protect your art but, at, but keep you in the line. And, and that's, that's kind of how I feel. I I always I, I've been saying for a while now that you the exactly what you said the com the commerce there's the word show and the word business and the word business has twice as many letters as the word show uh, and there's a reason yeah. and there's and there's a reason for that I always say like you got to look at the ROI of a specific thing you want on set so do you need the techno crane that day can you it, what's the ROI if you spend four thousand bucks to get the techno crane in for that one shot. Is it going to put in four thousand extra bucks in the return? Is it like what is what, at exactly. the end of the, like? Do you need to go shoot off this giant thing with a thousand extras, or can you do it another way that's going to be more cost effective and still tell the story appropriately, so we can make some money with this? Because it is, and I, I, I have to, I, I have to believe that you, you think this is true. It's tough to make money with movies nowadays. Very tough, much tougher than it's ever been. In fact, I got at to my peak. In, in career, let's say, at the moment that I would consider that would have been around 2013 or 14, uh, that there was – it was shockingly like, why? Can I actually not make a living at this? Can I make a living at this? I, it, like you actually <laughs> wow. think yeah. about that, which is not something that you think about in 20 years ago when they were making hand over fist. But it was very DVDs, insular and it was only five people and, and the, the, the DVD business, all that stuff. Now it's – in the indie side, it's a struggle. You can make a lot of money in the big side if you had – you know, you're fast and furious, right? That's a whole other story. Um, and even when you go to the streamers, they're, they're setting it up in a way where they're getting – they're giving you a little bit of vig above what the budget is that you can make some money on. But you better do 10 or 15 of those. Um, to have a real specific amount of income that then funds your company and then also has to fund your staff and, and your lifestyle, whatever that is. So you're actually looking at this as a regular job now, not as the way people used to think, where if you make it, 
you now are a gazillionaire driving the Bentleys. Not true. We have uh, we have definitely changed that in this business. So I mean, so you did you know you did the call with Haley Berry, who obviously yes. you know she's one of the biggest movie stars in the world, very well known, Oscar nominated, an Oscar winner, all that stuff. Also you know, a fantastic person. Yeah, and from what I hear, a fantastic. I, I fear yeah. she's. I hear she's a wonderful person to work with. Um, a, a film like that. When did that come out again? That came out a few years ago. 2013. Right? 2013. All right. So 2013 is a very different time than 20. Well, let's say 2019. Let 20, 2020 is a whole other conversation. Fine, but, but think about that. That's seven six years. Years. Six. Yes. Yeah. Six years. Right. So six years. The industry changed dramatically. If you had the call today. Again, let's not let's take COVID out of the picture. Let's say it's 2019, and you had the if you had the call today, do you think you would have made the same kind of revenue with the call today that you did back in 2013? I don't think it would have been in the theaters, and that movie was a wide release in the theaters. Yeah, I remember. That's how far the come. But I'm saying that was a wide release in the theaters. It made a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So the question to you is, I don't think it ends up in the theaters. So that's a whole other ball game. Now I say that movie gets made, it ends up on a streamer. And we make a lot less money um, unless we made it independently for a less money budget. And they bought it for a huge bidding war moment. And even then, it wouldn't have made as much money as, as it made uh, as a successful theatrical film. So, no, I, it's a double whammy. It's no, it wouldn't have made as much money. And uh, it wouldn't have been on the theaters. And so now I think that that that, that business has gone so dramatically – you know, uh, theatrical has to be something massively IP or massively. When I say IP now, I think of I think of producers and directors as IP too. If it's Neil Moritz, that's an IP. If it's Steven Spielberg, that's an IP, right? And that, everybody's talking IP all the time, but they're not thinking about brand IP too. So if it's not them um, or content that warrants that, like our film The Green Hornet, which is a massive property, wide release, big time budget, those types of things. Then why are they going to put? They're not going to, especially now. They're not going to roll out the red carpet for sort of a smaller film on a wide release. They're not going to do it. But isn't so. it funny that all the IPs you just talked about? These IPs were developed in the seventies, eighties, nineties, and Very early two thousands. These are not true. IPs. So like to have an IP, they're New just original. Yeah, it's a harvesting yeah. old IPs. They're they're harvesting old, the Green Hornets from the sixties. You know, yep. you know. So it, it actually it's, goes back further than that. Right, exactly. Like radio or, or, show in the in the forties, I think. Yeah, like the shadow, like the shadow was. Um, yeah. So it's it's fascinating that you know a lot of people are like oh there's very few directors in today's world that have the IP of a Spielberg, the Nolans, the Finchers, but those even those guys came up in the nineties and the early two thousands. You yeah. know, there it, it's you know Rodriguez, Tarantino, you know these guys that have marquee names, they still. All came up then. Like I'm, I'm curious. Like, what's happening? Like Ryan Coogler did Black Panther, but Ryan sure. Coogler is not a brand. Like people aren't going to no. go see Ryan Coogler films. I mean, unless they tell them, "Oh, this is the guy who did Black Panther." It's going to take a, a well, minute. Yeah, he's getting there. And, it's going to take time. Be, you know, for he's going to take time, but he, he can get there, and he probably will. Um, but but it's rare. Like you said, it's far and few between that get to that level. So if you have a handful, let's say there's you know, 20 names okay, that sort talking. of really matter, right? right? And you have maybe 100,000 actors per state, 100,000 directors per state, right? I mean, I'm just saying, like, it's it's very hard. It's very hard. Right. But and there is a tremendous amount of content that could be made and sold, but just not at a level that you think you're going to be sustaining some rich and famous lifestyle. So I always used to say when I was younger, of course, inflation needs to adjust for what I said. But if I'm making $50,000 a year and I'm making movies, that makes me a happy person. Now it's like you'd probably say a different number. You'd probably say 150 or 200,000, right? It's like what is the number? But it's not going to be the way it used to be. So you have to think about that too. If you're if your ego's in this and it's all about rich and famous and all that, it's just that's just not a goal. You have to love film for and or television and or storytelling for as much of that as you love it to do it on a regular salary. Because yeah, you'll have a couple of moments. Maybe you have a year that you had you did you made three hundred thousand dollars that year, and one year you made twenty five thousand. If you're not planning for that. And, and and averaging it over and then you have kids and you're married and whatever the heck your life is leading, it's really hard. So uh, keep 
keep that in mind now when you're going through the future of of content, which eventually is going to be AI, which is a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, and that's the thing is, I think Hollywood has been selling that story. I mean, for years. I mean, I, I talk to filmmakers all the time that think that they're going to make an independent film and send it to Sundance. And I'm telling them, dude, even if you get into Sun, if you're the 100, if you're one of the 118 or 19 films that they accept. It doesn't mean what it used to. Don't get me wrong. If you get into Sundance, it's fantastic. It's great. But it's not a golden ticket like it was in the 90s. No. It's, it's, I can give you a perfect example. I made a movie. It's called Them That Follow. It went to 2019 or 2018 or 2019. So very recent um, Sundance Film Festival. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has you know all really great actors, Olivia Coleman and Walt. And Goggins, and you name it. This the Caitlin Deaver. I mean, a lot of these actors blew up and sort of win a bunch of awards. Um, but uh, this this film was made for you know under two million dollars and uh, independent and and really well written and directed by two first time filmmakers. So exactly what your your audience is dreaming about, right? Sure. <laughs> Gets in, um, does not have a bidding war. Uh, one company buys it for not too far off from what we spent, right? And then releases it, and then success. It didn't. It didn't have like a huge release. It had a very limited theatrical release, followed by the typical streamers and everything else. So it was playing on Showtime and so forth. Good movie, really good movie. I'm very excited about that film actually, and it's launching a, a bit of careers around it. Some of the talent, but financially. We did our, we did okay. Everybody made a little bit of money, a little bit of money. But I have to go right into the next one to make some more because we're 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 we're, we're kind of like uh, you got to hustle. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 I wasn't even saying that on purpose. You got to hustle more now than ever to make the money that you need to to, to sustain a lifestyle. And that's and that's. The message I've been trying to preach from the top of the mountains. I'm so glad you, you know, someone like yourself is on the show telling people this because it's one thing hearing it from me again and again and again, but I always love hearing it from people who are actively working and doing. That's a perfect example. Like, oh yeah, we just had a film it's in a Sundance. Exam, yeah, we right? just had a film in Sundance. It was a two mil under two first million dollars. Time film, first time first directors, time film. first time filmmakers, right. and this is the reality of what happened. Did we make some money? Yes. If that's all we did that year, would it have been good? Probably not. I would have probably had to do something else. Like we have to keep the ball going. We, did. we had to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not like, and again, we'll go back to the nineties where this myth began, where you go to yeah. Sundance, you get a, a buyout of a million or $2 million. The movie cost $50,000 to make and you're good and you're good. Well, I'll tell you where the misconception is, right? That, and, and it's dangerous because it's the streamers early on. In the yes, of, I, the recent times of streamers, even in my year that we had that follow there, which was, I've been to Sundance a million times, but that's the first time I had a film in Sundance. So here's a guy who's been in the film business for a while, and it took me forever to get to Sundance. But I finally get there, and it's like, you know, great. It's a wonderful experience. I'm so happy to have the film here. But I wasn't the film in the same year. Late Night came and sold for like $20 million, right? You know, another couple of films like uh, British Girls and Marathon, all these movies, they, they sold for a lot of money. But the misconception there is who funded it? Where did that money go? And how much was the budget of that film? Right? So, so there's a bit of that that people don't think about. Oh, my God, they made an independent movie, went to Sundance and sold for $20 million. The movie cost fifteen. And then there's 12 other people who are taking part of that five, right? So it's like you don't really think – you don't know. You don't know the formulas of those movies. It's amazing that it got bought for that much, that it went to Amazon, that, every, that it was a great movie, which it was. So Sundance always does well with that. They have Every movie is really actually very good for its – for whatever the genre is or the person that's making it. And they're good at finding talent and it's a wonderful experience. I can't, can't take them. Out. But I want people's misconceptions to come down. The streamers are going to slow down on that. They're not going to. Well, they already have. have to do that. Oh, they already have. They already yeah. have. I they mean, still I go. I mean, well, we're in hope now, but. But yeah. I mean, look, when I was, I was in Sundance in 20, I don't know, 2016, I think 2017. And at that year, Amazon said, if you got into Sundance, you have an open, we have an open bid. We'll buy your film for $150,000 if, as long as you got accepted. And that was the thing that they were doing. Like, if you don't get anybody else, we'll buy it for $150,000. And then Netflix was buying a bunch of, like Netflix bought a ton of stuff. They don't do that anymore. Like you'll get the one or two, three outliers. Yeah, actually, 
definitely, definitely, yeah, Netflix definitely does not. They were not buying that year at all. But uh, Amazon was going for comedies. They bought like four comedies. You know, if there's something they need and it's really cool and it has a lot of stars, they'll go and they'll pay big for it when they're ready. But that's the thing. If it's something stars, stars, yeah. Yeah, no, big stars, big stars for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a it's a different beast, but yeah, late, yeah look, it really look, comes down to it. Well, look, you're saying late night. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Late, late night, late night was with Emma Thompson and uh, Mindy. Uh, I forgot her last name, and she that sold for twenty million dollars, and it was a comedy. Okay. But that's but that's not an indie. <laughs> like it is. No, it's not an indie. But it is. It is. But it isn't. That's fair. Um, there are big companies behind it. You right. Know, the, uh, the agencies and the and the financial companies that yeah, are it's... big, um, and then and then of course it's really a good romantic comedy, which usually yeah. doesn't go to Sundance, right? So uh, and uh, you know there's that, and and then there's also the the concept of um, you know what was the budget? I really don't even know what the budget was, but if the budget was fifteen, again, is twenty a huge deal? You know, you don't know who's taking that five. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, uh, exactly. What kind of back end percentages that they got, and, and exactly. All, it's right. at the end of the day, it would just be like, yeah, we all pulled in a hundred, hundred fifty thousand, <laughs> two hundred thousand each, which sounds great. But you know, if you live in LA, that's uh, you know, that's a month's pay. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's expensive to live here. Oh, it's it's it's, rid- it's ridiculous, sir, to live here. Um, now, let me ask you: What do you think the biggest mistake you see with first-time filmmakers? You know, in in either the pitching process or working with them, or you know, just like pitfalls that you see that they should try to avoid. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I mean, a lot of time it's ego. Um, that is usually the biggest one. Uh, inability to compromise, inability to, you know, adjust or see their the script that they have or that they wrote in another way or make revisions or, you know, they get caught in that whole, like, I don't want to be noted. Um, you know, they listen to too many <laughs> podcasts about being noted, maybe. No, no, uh, I, I'm not my podcaster. I tell them, <laughs> look, I've had whole episodes dedicated on how to deal with notes and you, you're going to have to deal with notes. Like, yes. And, but sometimes they're on. really good and they're, and good they're really helpful. Yes. Like they're not it's all good. idiot executives. Like everyone thinks like, oh, this executive doesn't know storytelling. No, he sits like, no, they don't get to those jobs for being idiots. It's just, it's, you know, there are times a, where there are executives who might have a note that doesn't totally make sense. I get that. But then you explain it and the, and that executive understands the explanation. You know, and and I just think that's a, a mistake because you're getting somebody from an outside perspective um, coming in and telling you from their experience, having know what gets green lights, what makes things work, right? Um, or what even is right for story structure and character. Come on, so notes is an issue. Uh, the the attitude of you need me more than I need you. Um, my genius, you know, my genius, sir, my genius. Yeah, Should you not do you not understand that. the presence you're in? You're in my you're in my genius. I'll I, I need three hours to tell this story. I need three hours to tell this story. And I just don't think <laughs> that anybody out there realizes at that earliest stage yeah. that it's a collaborative process. Yes. That your movie at the end of the day is not necessarily because of you solely it's because of your script supervisor pointing something out on the set your editor coming up with an ingenious way to fix a problem that you messed up in your (laughs) shoot okay and you have to that's why i always hate the film by credit a film by no it's not it's everybody who was on that list at the end that put that film together a film by the whole fucking the whole crew you know what i mean sure like not a film by one person. So that that's where the ego starts and you got to think about that. So more collaborative you can be, the more it, it, taking on the best people, the best cinematographer the best, for your budget that you can get and then listening to them because you hired them because you think they're great. Yes. Right? And putting that together and then letting the producer sort of set the stage and the tone of the schedule and the timing and the and the money and how that works and then you just focus on your vision and getting everybody to to sort of fit to that. That's how you do it. And that's the mistake of first time filmmakers. If, 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 if you can, I'll give you a little window into where my mindset was when I first started my first production company when I was 22 was called a tour pictures. So that alone. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's what I'm saying. And by the way, I am here because I had that energy and that ego at 21 to say, well, I'm not going to be a production. The hustle, I get the aggressive. I, but there's a, I did that in a collaborative way. And anybody who worked on that film, that first film, I, the way I handled the process, and I always talks about it to this day. It, it's just it's it's a way of understanding and being appreciative of everybody else coming to the table to make that vision happen. Not because you are the guy, the next Scorsese, you know, or Fina. Yeah, so everyone's the next Scorsese, Sofia Coppola, or or David Fincher, Chris Nolan. It's 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 yeah. It's, we can talk there about are people who are going to get there. There are people oh, who are no, going what? to be the but they come. But they come once every five to ten years, right. and it's not necessarily you. And by the way, it's better to be you if somebody else is telling you that it is, rather than you telling us that it is. Yeah. <laughs> if you're telling your, if you're telling everybody you're great, as opposed to somebody other yeah. people telling you that you're great, right. there's a difference in that situation. <laughs> if you're the next Corsese, they will let you know. <laughs> You don't have to tell anybody. Marty didn't go around saying, hey, do you know who I am? I'm Martin Scorsese. And do you know what I'm doing? No. Everyone else said it. And if you're – and that, they, let's just hold on for that thought for a second. Everyone listening, every great director that you know of, Spielberg, Scorsese, Nolan, Fincher, Kubrick, none of them went around with a billboard saying, hey, I'm amazing. That generally is not what greatness does. Greatness just works on the work and lets everybody else tell them how great they are. Yeah, and and look, there's a huge push, uh, which is long overdue in the industry, um, to get diversity and to mm-hmm. get uh, female directors going. And 50 to 60% of my films have been directed by females, not by just trying to be diverse, but by they sent a great script or they pitched a great project or I just – thought this was a great movie to make or whatever it is and so as long as you keep that in mind you, yes there is a significant way to go i think it's like four percent of, of oh. these uh projects are, are directed by females um of course that's in the film world the television world is getting is, is much more progressive mm-hmm. uh in that which is great um but you know a great idea can come from anyone any size any color any everything and i think that's another mistake that I would say first time producers make um, in, in, in just sort of how they were raised and how they were thought things were. And because, because, you know, when we mention greatness, we go Steven Spielberg, Nolan, we say Fincher, we say, but it's hard to say, you know, you know, Catherine Hardwick or, you know, uh, Catherine Bigelow, you know, Catherine Bigelow or it's Catherine's the Catherine's. Um, no, <clears throat> or just anybody like it's hard to go and, and give you like a 10 person list it's very difficult and that's that's ridiculous it is uh so we have to get past that and um and i'm hopeful that first-time producers will 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 be a part of that absolutely absolutely now how can you in today's world mitigate risk when making a film like what what is there things that you can do to your project in your opinion that can help you if there is no guarantees anymore, but at, at least mitigate that risk a little bit, because making a feature film is probably one of the riskiest financial investments you can make, unless yeah. you unless you know how to package, how to do things. You have those output deals, you have those relationships, for, you know, all that stuff. What can you do as an independent filmmaker to mitigate that risk? Well, if you don't have those relationships, you're, 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 <laughs> they just you're, don't do it. it. Just run away. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get your risk by keeping your budget as low as possible in that scenario. Um, and to do that, you have to start with something very contained. You know, whenever you whenever you see the movies that are made by first time filmmakers and they're just like in a room, or they're just in one location, or a like summer a camp, film, or a, or a, a summer camp. camp, exactly. You need to think contained to keep that budget down. If you have zero relationships, and then you relate your you're literally going to cold send to streamers or festivals or producers to say, look at my film. Can you help me sell this? Um, you know, that's one way. Another way is you, you make a short of that film, which that's been going on for, since the decades. And I, I do have to say it does work for me as a producer. I don't know about the streamers, but like if I get a, a short and then the script and I love the short and I love the script, it certainly let, gives me the opportunity to say, OK, you're a first time director, but I feel strongly about taking a chance on you. So just a heads up on that. And then the other thing is 
you can actually – it's not that hard to find out where who are and where are the, fo- the foreign sales companies. Um, and what they do is they mitigate risk by selling, pre-selling your film overseas. I did that on my first film um, where they pre-sell all the different uh, territories ahead of time to get you contracts that you can then bank um, for your making of your movie. So if you made a, a $250,000 budget but you got 100000 by selling the world early – um, you then now have another 150,000 that you need to, to, to get for the U S or for other remaining territories. That's another mitigation risk thing. Is there, is, um, pre-sale, then, but is pre-sale still a, as much as, I mean, I know before it was a lot bigger than it is now. No, it's, it's definitely changed. And I know that everybody always talks about how that market's dead. That market's dead. It's not dead. <laughs> it's just, it's dead. on life support. It's on life support. It's just, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it may be dead for the mid range films, right. the 12 to $15 million films, or even the $5 million films. But when you're talking about a hundred thousand dollars and you're going to, you know, I'm making that up a $200,000 film and you can sell $5,000 to each territory. It adds up very quickly. Um, I'm just saying in terms of getting a movie made, not about upside. You're losing the upside by giving that away, right? But you but make your about, movie. But you're making your movie, right? There, there's, that's another one. And then the last one is to, is to actually you know, have a script um, and, and literally go into the streamers or go into the companies and get somebody to um, say we're going to make this movie with you, which uh, you know, there are places like uh, you know, certain festivals and or contests and or uh, platforms – uh, that will do these types of things. Um, and I've seen that and I, and I don't, I'm blanking on the names of them right now, but, um, there are ways to do it, uh, that way. And you'd be surprised how many young people are in these streamers. They have so many employees and I'm, you know, they're going to hate me for this, but I'm just giving it away. Like I, you could find them on LinkedIn, you know? <laughs> and so you see this like lower end, you know, just out of college, uh, executive that's you know in netflix and you can connect to them or you know them or you ask twenty five thousand people you know in your orbit and say does anyone know anyone who know anyone who works in netflix or you have these facebooks that are like connected to this guy who's who's at facebook it's like there's a way to 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 get to these companies through the youth um who now have to make a name for themselves in the company who then found and discovered you with your great script that's going to be made for $250,000 and then they say, you know what, we'll give you a million dollars. Go make this film. Uh, well, you need it for our thriller silo, uh, you know, yada, 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 yada. Or those young executives start moving up within Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or whatever. And as they move up, they become more important and have more green lighting and, and you've been friends with them for 10 years. Um, and now you have a new film or a new project or a new person to bring to the table and, I'm just saying, or IP. I was a big time. There was something called the Hollywood Creative Directory. Yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Thick book. Oh, yeah. It had 200, 300 names in it. I called every one of them for any project before I would fly out to LA and then meet with the five that actually answered me. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, people used to write letters in the old days um, or before email. So you still have to do that just on the, whatever the new version of that is. You have to, and the new version of that is, LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, you know, whatever connection. I mean, look, I, got. I've, t- I've tweeted people and they've got, I've got, I've connected with people because I tweeted them. It's, it's, it's I'm yeah. a grown man it's, saying the word tweet. It's just, yeah. it, 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 but it works. <laughs> I mean, it, it's even on Bumble these days. You can probably see what they're doing and, and figure it out. But anyway, the point being that you have to be aggressive. You have to care about this and you can't think that it's about uh, rich and famous. And if you can get that out of your system, um, you'll get there if you're really if you're really persistent and and generally competent and somewhat talented <laughs> and and nice nice just nice yeah, totally. nice huge it's, not, it's, it's huge <laughs> it's huge. huge attitude humbleness yes um, all of that is so huge let everybody else you know help you along the way because you're just a good person who's talented but that's the way to go now how is uh, how is COVID affecting you right now how do you think it's affecting the business currently where do you see the business because i know no one has a crystal ball but i'd love to hear your thoughts on in the next six months in the next year what's going to (laughs) happen yeah no it's a good point it's actually uh already affecting the industry already changing the industry in dramatic ways where you can see the studios are making different types of deals of when theatrical starts and when you know universal afterwards 
Universal did that, though AMC and all that. It's it's all ever changing. And the reason why we don't have a crystal ball is because we don't know how many people are going to go back to the theaters when it's all over. Which, by the way, is probably after November third. But once all November third <laughs> comes and they announce <laughs> this miraculous vaccine and the miraculous treatments, um, you know, will people go back? And will they go back to the level they were before? Um, and does something like a tenant, does something like a Mulan or whatever the new thing that comes out, uh, you know, the quiet place too, does something make everybody go out, get comfortable and feel good. And, and then it's about the capacity. They're only opening 30% capacity. Will they open a hundred percent capacity? And will we're losing screens. Required all, like yeah. all of that yeah. screens, all of it. So my, my answer about COVID is we, in the beginning, the first three months of COVID were just like, all right, we'll just focus on development. Right, development, development, get the PPP loan, hold ourselves over. We're not in production. That's okay. We had a movie in post uh, called Wild Mountain Time, which is, uh, you know, hopefully eventually coming out. Um, and then we uh, we were focused on Green Hornet development. We're focused on uh, movies that we were going to shoot in the next couple of, you know, months, but now we'll just push. So everything just pushed a bit and we were able to hold and sustain. Now, if after November 3rd, this still sticks around in a oh. long-term kind of way that isn't solved vis-a-vis these, these options. Um, I think a lot of companies are going to go down, a lot. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's going to be a whole new world. And even as small as uh, our company is and as low as our overhead is, we will, we will struggle if it continues or we can't go actually into production. And the reason why indie film is affected the most, and I love how everybody was like, well, Indie films are going to go first because they'll be able to – they'll have less crew and they'll be – no, no, that's not how it works. What works is the big boys go first because they can insure themselves. They can pay for that extra PPE. They have you know huge amounts of money that they can, they can set up their franchises and shoot in weird locations and, and make it all work, lock down a studio that they own. Right? All that stuff is going to happen before indie. Indie has to like – can't take a risk that one person gets COVID or one person gets something – um, it just shuts us down for a week and we lose half of our budget. It's like we're, uh, we're, we're at a risk for that. So um, I think we're, we're slowly trying to figure out how we can get into production as indies. But um, most of it's focused on development just to see what the crystal ball brings. I really don't have any answers other than I know that the streamers are getting more powerful um, and the, oh. uh, the big studios are going to have to either buy or merge or create their own streaming systems to keep those eyeballs. Yeah. I mean, that's what, I mean, Disney, what did they have? 60, 70 million now subscribers. They did they, they, less than a year. It took Netflix forever yeah. to get that. I mean, HBO still, Disney has a built in though. Brand. Disney has a built in like guarantee that they were going to be able to be successful. And I never doubted that. Um, Walmart is interesting. Uh, if they come into this space because they have a huge, uh, uh following that they can really work. Um, and of course, Amazon, um, Netflix actually, although huge and not going anywhere, um, they're not tied to other things yet. And it'll be interesting to see if they, like Amazon's tied to groceries, right? Or, or tied to books or, or, or just selling. They're not diversified. They're not diversified at all. That'll be interesting. Do they get acquired? Do they acquire? Do they start to diversify in some way? Have to. Um, That'll be very, very interesting to see what happens there. Uh, and then the middle, mid, the little ones like the Peacocks and the, the when they're starting to build the HBO Maxes as they're starting to build, you know, it seems like as you can see with HBO Max, which is very interesting, it, it was really I knew it right away as soon as they named it HBO Max, I was like, you know what, HBO is going to get folded into HBO oh, Max. Oh, of course, make HBO Max the thing, and HBO is going to fold in, and uh, and it's already happening. So so Peacocks might have to do something similar too. I mean, how are they going to? You know, fold in and and Apple and, and, and there's and I just literally I know I'm behind the times. I just got Hulu like a month or two ago, like for the first time ever. Did, and I'm did like, you get Disney though. Oh, I know. I got I, Hulu and ESPN. No, no, I just got the Disney. I just got Disney. I got Disney a while ago. I got it before I was. I have kids. But so. isn't there a package for all three? Yeah, but I don't watch ESPN, so it's like it's a little bit cheaper. I don't know if it's uh, cheaper. Yeah. I, I don't know how it is. I have to actually look. It might be cheaper to get all three. Who knows? You should look. It might be free. It might be free. Right? But I just got Hulu, and I was like, oh my god, there's so much content, so much TV and movies, and I was blown away at, at HBO because it, it Hulu has the best of everybody. It's got a little bit of this, got a little bit of that, got a little bit of this network, got a little bit of that network. It, it is 
massive. So I, the, the whole streaming, the whole streaming wars, as they say, I, I still feel there's three big players who are sitting on the sidelines with a lot of cash who's going to come in and gobble up some people. Apple, Facebook, and Google. And they all have the money and they all want to get into this space because they do have diversified product lines. And having a Netflix, like if Apple, which they've already been talking to Netflix, if Apple bought Netflix, I mean. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's that's a juggernaut. Anybody who buys Netflix is going to be a juggernaut. Right, exactly. But Apple specifically, because of their infrastructure and because of what they do, I mean, imagine you buy an iPhone and you get Netflix for free. Like it, it just because it's like but like Amazon. Get, but to get but to get back to the COVID of it all, do you think that everybody's going to want to stay home and just watch content all day? Like I feel like there has to be a backlash that when this is over or we're past it or people just say whatever. Like we're, we're people want experiences. They go. They love to travel. They've just been told they can't. Right? They love to go to, like out to the movies on dates and do things. And like they love their cars. They love, I'm just how I, I just don't know if the at home experience will last like that. If there will be the the opposite black backlash scenario. That they, they, I don't know. I personally think that I, I can. I, I, from what I'm seeing. I think that it will. I won't ever get back to where it was, in my opinion. No, I that I'm not expecting. Yeah. yeah, I don't think you'll ever get back to January 2020. I, I, right. Those numbers, I don't think, will happen again, because we're losing theaters, we're losing screens, and now capacity within those theaters once we open up. So it's going to take a, a time to get the 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 trend was going down. The only thing holding the cards, the house of cards, up was Marvel. Like if you imagine taking Marvel out of the box office for the last ten years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do we have? Like Marvel is basically – Disney has been holding up the theatrical experience between all their brands, really. And then you have some Universal with Fast and Furious, maybe a James Bond here and there. But all these tent poles, is, a majority of them has been Disney, Warner Brothers, and Universal. Those are the three big boys that basically held it all up. I don't know if – if I think people will go back to theaters. I want to go back. I want to see Tenet and IMAX. I absolutely want to see that. But – I'm not probably doing that this year for sure and might be till next summer till I feel real comfortable. And I think people are – I think a a lot of people will rush out to go back to the theaters. But I think a lot of them are going to stay home because now they're used to it. And there's – and let's not say anything. The content's pretty amazing. The TV shows. Oh, oh, content's amazing. It's the the, the stuff that we have accessible to us at any moment. I mean, we've got but the one thing that doesn't work is I am not going to be able to assist nobody in the middle of this country or even in the middle class of this country. I was going to be able to sustain own, having Hulu, Showtime, Amazon. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, no. Yeah. You've got to pick and choose. Yeah. You got to pick and choose. Yeah. But that sucks because I want let's say somebody says like I want to know what's the best content. Right. So if somebody says to me. Okay, Hulu has got the best show on TV, but I don't. I'm not. I'm now going to become a member just to see the show and then take it. Like that doesn't work. There has to be a scenario where, like, okay, tonight, I, oh, I just want to buy that show on Hulu. I'm not going to be a member of you because I'm already doing this, but I, yeah. but I'll give you fifteen dollars to have the show. Or because in the old days you just bought the DVDs of the set. You know, yeah, you bought the show. It didn't matter what it was on. Yeah, I, I, I feel you. I don't think that'll happen. I feel you though. I wish you, yeah, because I like I wanted to see Hands Made Tale for a while, and now I've watched it. I'm watching it now, but before I like I didn't have Hulu, so I didn't watch it. Um, and then right. I, you know, like that's I'm, weird though that there's a demand for your show, and you can't find another pricing structure that allows me to to see that show. It's like this is what I used to say about the theaters. It needs to be variable pricing. I would hope that that comes through. Where if you go to see a Them That Follow, it's only six dollars, but if you go to see a Marvel movie, it's twenty five dollars. I'm totally up for that. You know what I mean? Like right. that, that is another way to drive people back into the theaters is variable pricing. So it should be the same thing. If I want to watch a show on Hulu, but I don't want to be a member of Hulu because I can't afford as a middle class person to, I have to have Disney and I have to have whatever. And it's like, boom, I, I, I can't have a $300 a month of all this. Content. <laughs> I mean, it seems but, silly. But, you're ta- but you're talking crazy talk, sir. You're talking crazy know, talk. Know, you, know, you mean you, you want the entire industry to, to come together and create a price structure <laughs> With multiple different companies, multiple different I, business models, it's 
I thought we were in a dream, man. I, mean, I was supposed to be dreaming. <laughs> no, sir. Business. So I don't know about you. We're in a nightmare in 2020. I have no idea. It's definitely oh, in, in worst a... year ever. I couldn't oh. even go through my own personal life to tell you how bad this year was. Was the worst year ever. I mean, it's worst it's year. it's horrible. It's a horrible, no. horrible year. And people are like, I can't wait for 2021. I'm like, don't you don't know? You don't know. Yeah. 2021 can make 2020 look like 2019. I... Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember when the year 2000 Y2K? Oh, of course. Of course. The world was going to blow up. I they would give for those it was days. Twenty years later, <laughs> I mean, that, and seriously, that's exactly right. You're absolutely right because I in, in I remember Y2K was ridiculous. I, I actually watched that that made for TV movie, the Y2K movie. Oh, it was great. Planes oh, were geez. falling. Planes were falling down. The visual effects were horrible. Oh, it was great. Didn't age well. Doesn't age well that movie. No. Um, <laughs> but. But that was the people were losing their minds back then, and now twenty years later, this is exactly what's <laughs> what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wanted to ask you: Do you have any advice for attaching bankable talent to well, your project? Advice. Bankable besides, talent. besides having an amazing script and a lot of money in the bank. Besides those two yeah. things, partner up with the managers. The managers are our producers. Mm-hmm. Um, so if there's a manager of that bankable star, um, he or she would love to produce the film. Um, so if you, if you, if you, I, I find it interesting for somebody who doesn't have any connections or is just trying to figure out how to get stars attached, you know, you have to do a couple of things. One, you have to, you know, start to network in a level that you say, okay, this manager reps like 10 really well-known actors. If I manage, if I can get them a couple of good scripts and they like them for, even if it's one of their stars, that's sort of like, you know, down right now that comes back, you know, there's tons of those. And when John Travolta went and came back and when Michael Keaton went and came back, like, that, you know, find the Michael Keaton and the John Travolta's before, you know, Pulp Fiction and whatever, uh, and, 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 and put them in your movies. But the manager's trying to get them work and, and needs to find something really great and, and let that manager produce with you so that they feel comfortable handling the star. And, and at the same time, you get to have a movie with a bankable star. I think that's a, another option to think about. Um, besides that, you know, you, you, they, stunts, you know, people do stunts all the time. You, 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 and then all of a sudden the star finds you because they want to work with you because you did some crazy stunt that involved a viral video that shows a good heart that this is a person that's trying to do something. Like I've seen that happen, you know, somebody that you never even heard of. Well, yeah, you like the Fresh Prince, situ- the, the Fresh Prince, the video that, that, yeah. the, the, the serious Fresh Prince trailer. And then Will Smith's like, <laughs> And by the way, that does actually look quite incredible. <laughs> no, no, I know, but it's constant. It's it, it, weird little like things like that happen. They get viral and they get called and they get brought in, and all of a sudden, um, they're they're st- said like, "Look, I'll do, I'll do, I'll be in your short. To make a short of this, and I'll be in your short, and that'll help you and lift you up in so many ways." And you know, I think there's a bit of that going on. And then it's again. Um, there's always the go find out what restaurant they're at and, you know, pop the script into the back of the car. And I've heard all those stories too. But <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's hard. There's no real, real answer. There's, sure. you know, there's working for companies that do it and, you know, be, you know, be in the mailroom as a young person in one of the big management companies and you'll interact with stars and you'll learn what people want and you'll become friends with those managers and those agents. And that's the barrier. That's the first barrier. Um, there's no miracle beyond that, you know, right place, right time, right project. Yeah. Or, or a really good script gets around town if it's really good. And, uh, since you're a producer and you ha- do see the entire process from the development all the way to final, uh, output and distribution, is there a part of the distribution process you wish could change? A part of the distribution process. process. Sure. I mean, absolutely. The answer would be. Um, all those fees that they put at the top <laughs> that they take off the top that, take that off are the top. down here and that by the time as they spend on P and A, oh. right, your number gets pushed down and, but the movie's doing better, but they have to get their P and A and their percentages and you just keep going further down. <laughs> um, I would, I would change the structure of where, uh, where the producers can, you know, get some money honestly that the, the distribution agreements have gotten to a level that even i think the distributors are tired of they could be 80 to 150 pages just the distribution agreements so you know that process of 
precedent. I we can only do what we've done before um, is archaic at, at times, and I really oh. do believe that even the distributors are probably uh, frustrated by it. But it's sort of it needs to needs to change a bit. So that would be the part of the process. The other part would be um, <clears throat> a lot of times the distributors have have to they're spending a lot of money so they have to blanket um sort of everything they have to get billboards and they have to get ads on tvs and they have to they just instead of trying to i guess revolutionize a system that goes directly to the consumer it's it it seems to be better for them to blanket the the world in essence or the united states um on all types of advertising platforms including digital to get the attention uh, for their trailers, their movies, their posters. Um, and, and it would be nice for somebody to come up with a system that sort of gives data to it that isn't streaming. I mean, obviously Netflix has figured out a streaming way to do it, but uh, a data system that helps them uh, use the money in a more specific way. So that instead of spending $30 million to, or $100 million to release a movie, you can spend less and get to more people. And that's going to come through technological advancements and programs and softwares. And I think after COVID, COVID is going to – I think I've been saying it for a while. I feel that Rome is burning in the distribution side of the world and in, in, in the space because the, the system is, I think you're saying, archaic. I agree with you. A lot of these companies are going to go down. And but they know system- that. They know that. They know yeah. it's that way. And and the question is are they – which ones are being inventive enough um, to to survive the change that's happening so fast? Every month it's a new change. Yeah, exactly. And I think after the – after the out of the rubble, something new has to come. Um, something new has yeah, to come. Yeah, yeah. yeah because really I've been I've been at these film markets, and I mean, from three years ago to 2019's film market, like I went to AFM, I was like, this is very different <laughs> than yeah. it was. AFM is extremely different. <laughs> do you go to like yeah. uh, those film markets? I do, I'm actually on their panels. I actually enjoy doing the panels for them. Um, but yeah. you know, it's a different type. In the old days, it would be much more like very industry focused. Mm-hmm. Now, I think it's a very much um, independent filmmaker. Uh, I guess the word would be like fans or um, educational. We're trying to break in educational. It's going more in that direction um, as opposed to the industry saying I need to be at the AFM specifically to do the buying and selling. I mean, they do it. There's tons of all the booths are there. It's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> but again, even the foreign sales markets have been changed. I'm sure AFM and all these foreign sales markets are doing a lot more virtual stuff now. They have to. Um, and, and, and that saves a lot of companies money because they would have to fly out, get the suites, spend a ton of money to be a part of that process that they have in their budget every year. And now they can't spend that as much anymore. So instead of spending like literally like 50 to 100 or even three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 for a company to come out here to go to Cannes, right, to do that, uh, you, you're telling me I saved uh, a couple hundred grand and I'm virtual and I made the same sales. Like there's going to be a bit of that. They'll mm-hmm. send maybe one representative instead of the whole company now uh, is what I'm betting. They're but don't worry. But, but they'll but they'll still charge the filmmaker full full Monty. Don't worry about that. That's <laughs> <laughs> don't, on the on the expense sheets. Are still going to be that three or four hundred thousand dollars in, in, in expenses, even though they went virtual. But that's another conversation for another day. <laughs> Yeah. Now what? Uh, now what? Not, not the fault. The, the the world itself set it up where that's what they needed to be. It's just I don't know how to change the model. They have to change the model. Okay. Now what? And what projects do you have coming out? So I have a movie that's in post. Uh, we're in the music elements uh, right now uh, called Wild Mountain Time. It stars Emily Blunt, John Hamm, uh, Jamie Dornan, and Christopher Walken. So it's new guys, awesome. new guys we've never heard of. Fantastic. <laughs> no, it's, it's awesome. It's really well done. It's written and directed by John Patrick Shanley, who's a famous playwright, also uh, wrote and directed um, Doubt, which won an Oscar for Viola Davis, oh, wow. and Moonstruck, Moonstruck, which won the Oscar for him for writing. Um, and uh, and he's he's he, he's great, uh, an amazing romantic fairy tale comedy uh, that is pushing all of these actors to to different. Uh, you know, uh, muscles of their own acting, and uh, and it's sweet, and it's uh, family oriented. There's not one curse in the movie, and uh, and and it's lovely. And in a time that we're dealing with sort of uh, nothing but morose news coming at us, and so I think it's going to play extremely well and uh, sort of break out, um, and hopefully even for award season because I think some of these actors have done 
an incredible job awards wise if, if if possible you never know that, that again that's about timing and where where is this going to get released this year so we're 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 debating it it's already got its distributor um which was meant to be theatrical which is bleaker street mm-hmm. um and the goal was to you know do this in uh in the fall but now we're talking about possibly uh, maybe the first of the next year because they've extended the award season until like February. Mm-hmm. So like you can qualify if you put out a movie January and February. So there's talk of that uh, sort of feel out what's going to happen and can we release and are they at 100% capacity? Because a movie like this when we make independent films and they go out and sort of they build the, the old Fox Searchlight method, you build like 300 screens and then you go to 500 screens and you go to 1,000 right. and you build if it's working. Um, well, you don't want to do that with 30% capacity. You want to do that with 100% capacity because you'll never know if it's really building. But um, so we have to make a decision, you know, and uh, how we're going to do it. And, you know, there's obviously talk of things that are like that are other avenues besides theatrical. So uh, we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I see. It's it's a weird and wacky world. So sir. that's so that's it. and then we're working on Green Hornet all the time. You know, we're 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 in talks with a. Uh, Fantastic A-list writer um, who will uh, impress when, when, whenever announced, and uh, and and we're going to try to you know go from the writer to attaching a director and then get some cast and build that. And the goal for that would be shooting somewhere in 2021 and maybe at the end to release in 2022. But you know all that stuff could get pushed. We don't know, but it's a big property. We're going to reinvent yeah. it. Yeah. It's not going to be in the Seth Rogen bench. It's not going to be as dark as a dark night, but it's going to be what is right to that brand. Um, and, you know, think more like Bondish uh, in terms of the tones. Yeah, because that, that film is, uh, you know, for better or worse, it was introduced to the world in the 60s with that, that campy show with Bruce Lee, which was the highlight of the show was Bruce Lee. Um, sure. But, I'm, I'm, and then Seth was just, super campy as well was kind of like a fun funny film but i would be interesting to see how that could be turned into a a more serious james bond-esque yes style style thing and yes it's and we we pick the right writer for that um but but no we're gonna do it as a two-hander so it's gonna be not the driver Cato. No, it has it's to be. Gonna be. It's it's actually called the Green Hornet and Cato, and so we are going to have it as a two hander. We're going to have uh, an interesting new sort of storyline, um, and we will will build it for generations so that it can be you know multiple sequels. Uh, yeah, absolutely. As it's as they always say, sequels, baby, sequels, lots and lots of. And sequels. the funny thing is, it's coming back to Universal. Universal had it at one point, and so Universal has been super supportive and extremely rolling out like every red carpet. You know, going after the best of the best for this movie. Um, it's a top priority for them, and and we're we're so happy to have our team there. Yeah, I'm sure they want another IP that they can, you know, they can make twelve yeah, well, uh, twelve movies right? from. <laughs> Well, you think about it, they don't, they're not like Disney's connected to Marvel and Warner Bros. is connected to DC. And so they have the Monsters universe, but in terms of the superhero stuff. And what we like about Green Hornet that's so great is it's not a superpower type of uh, figure. A, this is more of a real man superhero than it is of the spectacular, you know, big time powers. special effects. So more James Bond esque. More, more James Bond esque. Right. I think yeah. that's what I'm excited about. Yeah. Very cool. Now I'm going to ask you a couple questions to ask all my guests. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? I think I gave a lot of that advice in this whole <laughs> thing so far. You're asking for a new piece of advice. Or just a specific. Uh, If you're trying to be a filmmaker, you need to understand every single part of the process. So if I were you, I would be an actor, I would be a writer, I'd be a director, I'd be a producer. I would go and put the lights up. I would learn how to move the – be the grip. Like those things that they do in the film schools are for a reason. And well, you're the grip on somebody else's film and then you're the – so like do that. If you can't afford film school and you can't afford to make a movie, try to like take little jobs and and be in the construction side of the production design. Like learn what everything's going on because no matter whether you're the producer, the director, the writer, the actor, you will now have an appreciation for the whole process and how much hard work goes into it so that when you're talking to them, they're not low level on the totem pole. They are a job you've done that you understand. And I think that's the best way to start. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, or in life. (laughs) 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 Oh, man. 
Uh, the lesson that took the longest to learn in the film business was that nothing is instant and that it takes forever. <laughs> I, mean, I have projects on my development project list that have been there for 10, 12 years. Oh, and we're still at, and we're still at And so, I mean, th- th- when you're young, you're like, yeah, we just go make a film. And I, I went and made it and it happens. And, and, and as you c- progress in your career, that, that doesn't happen. And, and to stay humble about that is really hard. And the lesson in life um, that I, what was the what was the first part? Of it that? was the, it, the longest. Uh, the lesson I took you the longest to learn more than the film business or right. in life. Well, in life, every time I say I'm not going to do something, so I'm not going to move to the valley. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go into TV. I'm not gonna. Whenever I say I'm not going to, ends up not only happening, ends up being the thing that I should have been doing a long time ago. Yep. I'm never going to move to LA. Uh, whatever you're fighting internally in your life that you're like, I'm never going to do that, but you really probably should or really want to. Um, I, I say do that as soon as you possibly can, as opposed it's to great the not. advice. It's and, great and it's so advice. Critical. It's inside your body. You feel this like internal struggle. You're stopping some flow to actually open up your life. And I can't tell you how often I have handcuffed myself still to this day. On stuff like that. I'll give you a perfect example. I've always wanted to do a podcast. I feel like I'd be pretty good at a podcast. You're fantastic, sir. You're fantastic. So, but I, I have this internal struggle and never actually do it because I'm like, just can't seem to get over that hump. And of course, there's time management issues for me. But the truth is, whatever that is, that is, is internally like, I'm not going to do this, but I really want to. Just open up and do it and stop being afraid. Kill fear. Go for it and do it as fast as you can because the older you get, the, the harder that is to do, the harder to take those risks, the yeah. harder to move those barriers. And, 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 and I can't implore that enough. That's life and film. Abs- eight. Preach, sir. Preach. That is <laughs> that is some of the best advice And after doing over 400 episodes of this show. <laughs> Probably one of the best answers to that question I've, I've had in this, on this show because it is so, so true. It took me forever to go out to LA <laughs> from so, Florida. I was in Florida and it took never me do it. forever. And I, and, my, and I looked at my girlfriend who's not my wife. I go, look, we have no kids. We do it now or the second, if we, if we, if it's going to be harder every year we wait, it's going to be a bit harder to do it. And, uh, absolutely. Great answer, yeah. great answer. Yeah. And the toughest question of all, sir, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, I hate that question. <laughs> I hate it. Passion. But I'm going to name a film that nobody uh, talks about from a – guys don't say this is their favorite film. But it's in my top five. I have a top five and I, sure. this is in my top five. Titanic. I love and Titanic. Why. Love, love Titanic. People don't talk about it. As a producer at that time, Making that movie for $200 million and making it feel and historical with a love story and action and a a special effects. It was, it was incredible and it deserved to be at that time the greatest, you know, selling film of all time. Titanic baffles me. It's the only movie I've ever seen in the theater with the ticket for the movie theater five times. I mean, go back to see a three and a half hour movie five times. I was, that was a big one. Goodfellas is a huge one. I can't stop watching Goodfellas. I'm Italian, but I'm also a Scorsese fan. You know, there, that, that's a near perfect movie. Uh, I, I wrote a dissertation on it. Like, um, that's a big movie for me. Goodwill Hunting was a huge movie for me because at the time that those guys were 25, I think I was, I'm similar to their age, and um, they had written a movie, won an Oscar. It had all the elements I wanted. Robin Williams doing a non comedy, you know, the struggle of a real life person in that world and i just love that movie it, it reminds me of the dead poet societies and the stand by me's and this kind of genre that i love so good mm-hmm. hunting was up there uh cinema paradiso wonderful up there oh, wonderful. <laughs> fantastic film anyone who's a film lover loves that movie it, again italian but um just 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 sweet with the with the mentory grandfathery roles and the kid and the love of film i mean oh, I, even if you're not a film person cinema paradiso is just like but bam! But of course, there's so many incredible movies. Sure, that sure, are sure. Way better than these three that I probably mentioned. But I just, you know, I can't, you know, 
Those are the ones that, hey, it's, it's uh, that. It's answer, just what comes to mind. It's what affected me. It's what affected me during that that's, time. That's the question. I've, I've had, I've had, uh, I've had um, big it's time. It's a better way to make that, that question is to say, what three films are the ones that affected you the most, as opposed to say the greatest to, to you of all time? Just an idea. Just an idea. You know, I mean, uh, after, after 400 episodes, I might have to switch you right. Um, <laughs> you might, that's my bad. But I've actually had people come on. I've actually had people that are big time filmmakers and they'll say the weirdest movies. And I'm like, really? Like, like I would think you would say Goodfellas or, you know, Seven Samurai or Citizen no. Kane or what are they? And they'll say like, you That's know, affected them. Yeah. but like I had one guy said, enter the dragon. And I'm like, really enter the dragon. I'm like, I love enter the dragon, but enter the dragon. Enter the dragon. And I was like, I mean, I love enter the dragon, but on the scope of like the greatest films of all time, it's, it's wonderful, but it's, I, I, and from this, from this person, I was like, wow. He goes, I saw it when I was a kid and it affected me. And right. Like, it affected me. Exactly. So that well, was- I'll tell you a movie that affected me, uh, but I don't consider it the greatest film of all time. But um, I can't stop referring to and or just talking about a movie that nobody's seen. I'd, I'd be shocked if you saw it. It's called Stir of Echoes. Yes. The one with uh, Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon. Yeah. And it was uh, directed and it was written and directed by David uh, Coop. Yeah, David Kep, right. David Kep, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's great. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> film. It did no business, so nobody knew about it. But, no. but like, I had that DVD. I had the special edition. Oh, yeah. I, I, uh, just that. And Get Shorty, uh, another one that I could not get off of. Get Shorty, just the comedy side of, like, you know, the the John Travolta being, like, sort of that mafia type. It thing. was. I mean, just weird. I just had I, I just it. had Barry on. I had Barry Sonnefeld on the show the other day. Did you? And, and we talked about Get Shorty. I mean. That's the, one of my favorite interviews of all time. It's he's, so, he's so oh, good. I'm sure. Getting he's him is, so mm. good. It was like uh, first 10 great. minutes, just the first 10 minutes alone is how he started off as an adult film uh, cinematographer. Uh, that's the first 10 minutes and the most graphic. Well, that's, well, that's everybody knows that about him. The gra- most graphic conversation <laughs> about a porn set I've ever heard in my entire life. Really? Within the On first the 10, podcast? within the first day, he goes, how, 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 how hard do you want me to go? I go, Barry? You can go as hard as you like, sir. Okay. And he lays in the, within the first 10 minutes. I'm like, this is going to be an amazing conversation. And we, we had a two hour conversation. Oh Such an amazing guy. I just love talking to him. I have to listen to that one. That's <laughs> awesome. Is that on or is that fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, it's available. I'll send you a link. I'll send you a link. Um, right, good, good. but listen, we could keep talking for at least another two hours, sure. Bradley, but I, sure. uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate your, your time and, and you dropping amazing knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much for, for doing what you do. And uh, I look you, forward to you. seeing all your projects. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Be well. I want to thank Bradley for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the tribe. Thank you so much, Bradley. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 437. And if you haven't already, please head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really helps us out a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E dot com.